Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are back for another 6-5 podcast, my favorite day of the week, and I'm here with my incredible co-host, extraordinaire, looking great in his glasses on a Friday morning, Daniel Newman from Future and Research. How are you, Daniel? I'm just showing off the hat, man. There's like right. an event coming up in June. It's going to be epic going to be the who's who we'll call it the davos of tech and it's going to be on the six five which buddy i mean how yep. great is that? we should call it six five summit we should we should how about that now this is great so if you if it's your first time to the six five podcast we cover six topics five minutes each but we usually talk a little bit more uh we we do analysis here we don't really talk about the news. Sometimes we have to talk about the news to give some context for the analysis, but um, this is what it's all about. We're going to talk about publicly traded companies too. Uh, please don't say anything. Take anything that we say as investment advice. There you go. In fact, just do the uh, exact opposite of what uh, you think we might be inferring. But no, we do have a great show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Intel, two things going on there. You know, new Intel Arc and them acquiring a company called Granulate. We're going to be talking about uh, Oracle Heatwave. We're going to be talking Micron Earnings, Grok Day, and an IBM quantum announcement with HSBC. So, Daniel, let's jump right in here. Intel Arc GPU launch. So, Intel uh, is the market leader in what's called integrated graphics. And that's graphics that are integrated into the SOC and notebooks or, or desktop. And it's really been IBM, sorry, it's really been uh, AMD and NVIDIA who have been pushing discrete graphics for, um, for forever. But black and white, Intel is now in the discrete graphics market. And this week it announced uh, ARC 3, 5, and seven for mobile, and that's not for smartphones mobile, that's for uh, notebook. So uh, I think it's been since 1998, I'm gonna have to go uh, double check with the i740, uh, they brought out their last discrete. But uh, I, I wanna, you know, instead of getting into the, the nuts and the bolts of the technology, because what I've seen is, is at least for ARC 3, which uh, announces today, and then ARC, uh, five and seven uh, available early summer of this year, which I believe is a is a is a push out uh, of that. I thought they were all I thought they were all coming uh, here. Um, it's a good. It, uh, there's no other way to look at this other than positive, right? There's very few black and whites that us analysts can put our hats on, or for that matter, even uh, you know retail investors or people like that. But this is a black and white, right? One day Intel isn't in the discrete graphics market and and now uh, it is. And I think that's the thing that should be focused on. And the 357 is exactly what you would expect, right? Different tiers of performance uh, and, and power draw. Intel is calling uh, ARC 3 enhanced gaming. Uh, ARC 5, sorry. Oh, ARC 5 advanced gaming, not to be confused with enhanced gaming and then arc seven for high performance uh gaming uh we really don't have any uh any of the deets uh on on five or seven uh looks like oem support is uh is pretty strong at least the the ones that we were briefed under under nda uh the the uh it looks like the what i'll call the um leader uh skew is a it's a design from uh samsung that was announced at uh, at CES uh, 2022. Uh, the final, uh, it's called the Galaxy Book 2 Pro. The final thing uh, that I wanna talk about is, is looking at the future, right? Um, there are a lot of interesting things you can do when you have access to the CPU and the GPU and you fund most of these notebook designs, which uh, unlike AMD, uh, Intel does uh, more than anybody. And there are some interesting things you can do with power. There are some interesting things you can do with actually sharing 
um, performance between the iGPU and the discrete ARC uh, GPU. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's really what I'm looking at is can Intel do what AMD can't by integrating the CPU and uh, the GPU? Yeah, first of all, this was a big announcement. Uh, we've all been sort of waiting on the edge of our seats to see, can Intel come into this space? Can they not only enter it, can they be good at it? Uh, Intel's been under a lot of pressure across the business to grow, to diversify. We heard at Investor Day, Pat seemed, uh, Pat Gelsinger, not Pat Moorhead, although both of you are semiconductor bulls, seemed very optimistic that the ARC business would be important and meaningful and somewhat a quick trajectory to get into the b -b 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 billions of dollars of revenue for Intel. Um, of course, gaming is an opportunity. I do think uh, Intel's always had on the you know, desktop side some pretty strong support in, in specific areas related to um, to GPUs, but on the on the mo on the sorry on the PC on the uh, you know uh, laptops, it's been slow, and this is what we've been waiting for. So the gaming is going to be an area that we're going to have to watch closely to see if they can enter, if they can compete, if they can be successful. Of course, with their relationships and the OEMs, they will get SKUs that will be in inclusive of their their uh, new Arc um, GPUs, and that will be a great way to get into it. We've already seen. Uh, Samsung, Acer, Dell, Lenovo, all are making commitments to play in this space. Uh, as they go up up the stream with Arc 5 and Arc 7, will those provide uh, a, more of a strength and competition to the, the AMD and, and NVIDIA SKUs? Remember, those, those companies, it's not just about the technology. It's like a religion. And so that's going to be the real question is, you know, will Intel be able to find religion within that gaming community? Another couple interesting things, though, Pat, that is probably worth mentioning is there is an opportunity for growth in this space that isn't just related to gaming, um, you know, growth related to data and analytics. You know, in uh, Mike Diamond's research note from our team, he put it out. He basically talked about the mathematicians, st statisticians and how fast that business is growing. Um, 3D sensing technologies for LIDAR, for instance, and how much that is growing. Um, all of these are going to be key areas for GPUs and their markets where Intel could potentially use its strength to enter to sell more volume. Um, so, you know, it's early days, Pat, but, um, you know, I think uh, it, it said that the company is aiming to, to, to ship like about 4 million discrete GPUs in February alone. So there's an opportunity to move. Um, it's going to be competitive. This is one that we're going to have to come back to and say, did the company execute? I'm more confident than I've been in a long time in Intel under uh, Pat Gelsinger's leadership, but uh, it's going to be very, very tough sledding. Um, but I'm I'm optimistic, so I'll leave it there. No, those were uh, those were good adders, and I think uh, people too quickly forget the new businesses that Intel is is getting into, and you know, quite frankly, with the supply uh, at the level they're at, they're going to sell everyone that they can make. It's key for them to stick their positioning, though, in uh, in gaming. Daniel, let's move to the next topic, uh, Oracle Heatwave. First of all, what is Heatwave and uh, what's new about it? Absolutely. So, Pat, it's, it's funny. Um, you and I both control the Chirons. <laughs> I know. Every once in a while, it seems that you and I go off the rails and we cannot do it at the same time. So you know, let's start at the high level. You know, this goes back to a decade ago when uh, Sun Microsystems um, was acquired by Oracle, which was MySQL. Um, since then, you know, Oracle's kept MySQL relatively distinct. Uh, about 15 months ago, Oracle released what's called MySQL Heatwave. Um, and it's basically the company's own uh, optimized implementation of MySQL running on Oracle's OCI infrastructure. And for those of you not familiar, Pat and I have talked a lot about uh, a very bullish sentiment on Oracle Cloud. This is MySQL running on Oracle's public cloud platform. Um, and basically what happened this week is a third release of Heatwave, uh, scaling up node size, reducing costs uh, for certain workloads, um, in, and introducing probably what was most notable here and that is the in-database machine learning. Um, 
our team is currently in the process of, of, of a research, a brief that is going to come out on this. And so, you know, I had the chance to kind of review, break it down. And here's kind of what I think is the most interesting about this particular iteration of the MySQL uh, launch and moving into ML. Um, first of all, they've added its native support for machine learning. It's full automation. Uh, it takes advantage of the autonomous database and technologies that Oracle has been pushing very aggressively. Um, it's explainable AI, which is becoming an increasingly important topic right now as uh, we're looking for more transparency. So all models in Heatwave ML are going to be explainable. Um, they're differentiated, therefore, as well. Uh, but also probably what's going to be most attractive about it is the improved performance, um, the quality, repeatability of the explanations, and, of course, some of the scaling. So you have things like scaling with cluster size, real-time elasticity, um, more data per node. So these were kind of some of the breakdowns that our team identified as, as key differentiators. Um, you know, as we, we went through, by the way, Oracle did a bunch of benchmarking. So I'm going to comment on their benchmarking just a little bit, but I also want to be very clear that that commenting put Oracle clearly ahead of uh, com competitors, uh, Amazon, Google, um, and others in this space. Having said that, these are benchmarks that require um, could uh, opportunistically be challenged by the other uh, companies, Pat. But at this point, and you got to wonder, because by the way, in the second release of Heatwave, there was also some very strong benchmarking that was released. And none of the competitors have stepped up and done any benchmarking or done any, um, have, have, a, have kind of, uh, what is it, publicly debated these strong numbers. So you got to wonder if the if if uh, Redshift or if BigQuery felt that they were able to outperform and it was going to be clearly measurable. You'd think they would have done those benchmark tests and put those into the market, and and they haven't. Um, you know, as we sort of assessed the conclusions and recommendations, um, you know, we basically found that across the the, the cloud DB market that um, you know the value was pretty tremendous. Uh, the price value for the technology. Um, you know, they had a hard to beat feature set, auto ML, scalability, real time elasticity, uh, the amount of data per node, the, and the overall the portfolio wide enhancements that they were able to do. But more so than anything, Pat, it was the price performance that we really walked away from. Um, we also found that, uh, you know, the benchmarks demonstrated clear outperformance at this current time against Redshift, Snowflake, Synapse, and BigQuery. Uh, all of them, according to the data that we were able to review, uh, were both more expensive and, neither, and none of them per, had the same level of performance, which, you know, we think believes uh, warrants that the companies that are in review cycles right now probably need to spend some time evaluating what Heatwave is offering. Um, and by the way, very strong. I mean, this is almost a, you know, Oracle's always been a database company, Pat, but this is one of those things that's truly showing how they're taking their infrastructure and their database, uh, the legacy and, and, and engineering prowess they've had in database for a long time and putting it together to offer a significant differentiation in market, layering in autonomous database capabilities, competing uh, at scale against major public cloud players and finding something that's differentiated. Um, so a very good release, Pat. Um, and uh, some pretty impressive numbers. Good analysis there, Daniel. Uh, by the team, uh, our um, our analyst uh, Matt Kimball uh, wrote a uh, wrote a note as well that I'll put in the uh, in the show notes. And essentially, <clears throat> this is so you know heat heat wave heat waves incredible performance has a lot to do. That's all all in memory, right? Where other solutions are uh, spooling out uh, back and forth to uh, back and forth to, to disk. So, architecturally, that that gives Heatwave uh, a big advantage on performance, per, pretty much versus anything <laughs> that that touches the disk. So, uh, that doesn't surprise me. And like you said, um, I didn't see Oracle Heatwave competitors saying that these benchmarks were wrong. Uh, either so, I think they, I think they know. And this this next step, this was the first update in I think 15 months. Added machine learning in the database at no extra cost. So um, even though Oracle is a premium uh, provider, uh, then being able to essentially you know uh, commoditize a machine learning is 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 pretty fun. And whether that's 
you know, with with auto ML, which is is key. And that's that doesn't mean that it's just magic and you don't have to, to do anything. But auto ML makes ML a heck of a lot easier. You don't have to be necessarily a, a data science to uh, to to have uh, to have it happen. So, you know, heat wave ML, not only is it higher performance in because, you know, you actually have the machine learning inference in in the database uh but it's also uh basically free so uh once again an architecture play on something that i think is 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 pretty important and you know if i i love the idea of a premium vendor like oracle uh commoditizing uh ml and i know exactly who <laughs> who this is targeted at it's it's 100 percent targeted at it at uh at redshift and uh and how you architect uh redshift and get machine learning uh, out of that so check out the reports from uh both of our companies if you want uh, some of the uh gory gory details and the details are good I, i'm not boomeranging per se here pat but i do love the fact that you did mention them in memory because that is such an yeah. important differentiator so i'm glad you you caught that out because i don't think i mentioned it so uh anyhow good stuff there Listen, this is why we both talk about this, Daniel. If we were just repeating each other, how interesting of a show would that be? It'd be a snoozer. So, yeah. Yeah. You know. Some of the companies might like it, but uh, I don't think that people watching trying to get the analysis would be all that all that excited about it. So, exactly. Want to keep moving? Want to keep moving? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's go to the next topic. And uh, Intel is acquiring a company called uh, Granulate. So, Intel is the unit share and market share leader uh, for servers. I think their market share is around 85% or 80% today. And AMD has the uh, the lion's share of the rest. And then you have folks like IBM Power and IBM Z, and of course, ARM uh, in there as well. So um, one of the biggest challenges uh, inside of a data center is efficiency, right? You don't wanna burn uh, too much wattage and all things equal, ceteris paribus, the more uh, power you put into the system, the more performance that, that you're going to get. And there have been a, a lot of ways uh, that uh, CPUs can moderate the amount of power they draw. Some of these are inside of the CPU. It goes all the way back to Intel speed step 20 years ago to be able to bring a uh, voltage and frequency uh, up and down depending on on what you're doing uh, but granularly some, sometimes you need um, uh, additional software to make that happen so what granulate does is it fine grain um, uh, when it comes to things like microservices that are a lot harder to modulate with with power it allows you to modulate uh, performance and and power does not require uh, any um, developer intervention uh, on the operating system or on the application. So if your application isn't very good at working directly with the new breed of CPU or the operating system isn't, you can use Granulate uh, to do that. My expectation is that uh, Granulate gets sucked into some lower level uh, firmware or some type of driver that makes it even so auto magic that even the uh, end enterprise doesn't have to do anything. I did a did a, get a tweet from uh, Dylan Martin who said, "Hey, uh, I, I have a leaked memo from Intel that says that they're going to be selling this." By the way, those can both be true. You can be mm -hmm. selling it today, but in the future, it could get sucked into. Uh, uh, sucked into the firmware to make it even easier and enterprises wouldn't have to load any software. Well, doesn't that basically address what Intel is trying to address by by effectively making this acquisition, moving up or I guess moving closer to the silicon layer where this optimization automa automation takes place? I mean, there's been software for a long time that companies buy and invest in to try to opt uh, you know, as I said, a lot of it happens like in the in public cloud, for instance, it's in the control plane. You know, you're trying to optimize workloads, you're trying to optimize um, software to, you know, make the compute work as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, you want to boost performance of every core. Um, and so the idea of being able to, you know, 
do this more, uh, quote unquote, what did you say, auto magically? Yeah. Um, and that really is what this is all about. And Intel solving a problem that tends to go out the stack. So you go from, you know, the, you know, we love to say you can't run silk or you can't run software on air, right? So silicon is the one common ingredient, no matter what workload you're running, you're running it on something. And so as companies sprawl of software, as they need to optimize more and more every workload in their data center, try to get maximized every core, um, Intel has the opportunity to be a partner to these companies in terms of streamlining and um, autom automating that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, it, it's still fairly high level to me, you know, in terms of uh, how the company's gonna monetize this, how they're gonna make it inclusive, how they're gonna, you know. Um, but I do think software optimization is got to be part of the story right now. And so this acquisition gives Intel the opportunity to expand their story, um, you know, and help customers reduce CPU utilization and app latency, which is a big thing that every company is doing. They're either buying software to monitor it. And in this case, um, you know, they're, they're actually looking at ways to implement it where the customer doesn't have to think about it, just put it in play. So See, it's all magic, baby. It's auto magic like it should be. Yeah, yeah, so it's funny, in the entire press release, it didn't say if it was using AI or machine learning or some, some sort of deep learning, but essentially it learns your application. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Daniel, let's uh, move to the next topic, and that is Micron earnings. I think this is the first time, Daniel, we've talked about Micron earnings on the show. Look, Pat, there's nothing more popular right now in the tech press and media than semiconductors. Like I said, what are you going to run the app on air? We also need, uh, you know, you need memory and storage. And with every workload and every bit of compute, um, you additionally need more memory and storage. So it's been a really interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting opportunity right now to talk about kind of what's going on there. And then of course, there's the supply chain, there's the Ukraine-Russia war. So semiconductors are even more in focus. Uh, with a company like Micron, you know, uh, what was the focus? Well, first of all, high level patent, since we don't just repeat the news, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straightforward and just say this. Beat on earnings, beat on revenue, um, you know, strong uh, forward guidance, looked very encouraging. Uh, what did the market glom on to uh, after he was able to uh, outpace? Well, one is, Where's growth coming from? Well, for, for Micron, uh, growth is coming from the data center. That's the big part of the business that's been growing. So, you know, I think there's a lot of worries about what's going to happen to memory and storage when some of these secular trends go cyclical. So we've had secular trends in PC growth and adoption. We've had secular trends in smartphones. We had a pile of stimulus pumped into the market that drove people to buy more of these things. And then on top of that, you had schools forced to outfit every kid with a PC. You had workforces forced to give every employee PCs or update to new PCs. And we've seen the PC market be incredibly robust. I think both of us would agree, Pat, that the PC market will stay robust beyond what most think. Meaning it's not, this isn't a trend that's gonna reverse and go down 25%, but there is a good chance, Pat, that in the next few quarters, the trend will reverse and it will slow a little bit. Um, and so Micron's been working hard to shift into areas to be able to support, you know, with NAND, things like 5G on mobile device, or the 5G trend with mobile devices, uh, data center, uh, and the importance of additional storage and memory technologies there, seeing 60% growth year over year in, in this uh, most recent quarter. Um, also moving into things like automotive and memory and storage, which is another area that's very important. Uh, Pat, what, what did the analysts focus on? Well, this is kind of interesting. Everybody wanted to know about um, what's gonna happen with uh, neon gas and other uh, raw materials, right? So we're hearing this again, this is the thing now, right? About half of the world's neon gas is produced in the Ukraine, and it is important for uh, what's known as lithography, um, which is basically, you know, the way you see these little circuits etched onto the to the wafers or onto the circuits. And so, um, most of these companies, Pat, have already dealt with this. They've been dealing with this for some time. And going through the supply chain resiliency activities over the last couple of years, they've been diversifying where they're getting. Marota. Marota, I don't say that out loud very much, Sanjay Marota, the CEO of, of Micron, did say that there is a chance that some of these raw materials could go up in cost uh, if there is a need to acquire uh, them from different sources and if this war was to linger on too long and all this um, manufacturing stop. Pat. Also, they shut down China again. They had like four cases of COVID and they shut down parts of Shanghai. 
uh, very interesting. Can't figure out exactly how that works, but that has also created a little bit of worry that there could be some other uh, supply chain disruptions coming out of China. Overall, um, on the call, it seemed the company was very confident that it would manage it. It's diversified its supply chain and that it would be able to handle. There might be some additional cost. Pat, my take on it is that there is some elasticity, but in memory and storage, less elasticity than in, say, general purpose CPUs, where there tends to be more flexibility on pricing. So uh, overall, though, the company seems to be in good shape, seems to have its supply chain in order. Its growth in data center has been impressive. It's got an outlook of mid-team growth for DRAM, 30% growth for NAND. And um, I personally believe that their sustainable growth has to come from the strength in data center, but also the growth in adoption in 5G and then their automotive and industrial uh, efforts. Wow, you did well here. So the company beat beat on the top and beat on the bottom. And you know, if you wanna compare beats, uh, it was the biggest beat on revenue uh, in over a year, which, which was really good. And uh, the biggest beat on EPS uh, for three quarters, uh, where it goes all the way back to Q3 of, of 21 when they beat by 9%, but they beat uh, 8% here. So they're crushing it. Uh, what I wanted to comment on is, is how strategic the company is uh, and how strategic storage and memory is going to be even more in, in the future. It's pretty easy to say, you know, we see this, all these data slides that, you know, shows how data is growing and um, storage and memory are essentially directly in line with those. More storage uh, than, than memory as memory typically go up, goes up in increments. But what we're gonna see, the future of the data center, you know, Micron really is driving uh, that future. So today in the data center, uh, you, can, you can compose uh, the compute and you can compose the storage, uh, but what about the memory? right? Every time you need a lot more memory, you have to buy more compute. Compute guys love that, but it puts, uh, if you're, all you're looking for is more memory, then uh, you're basically overpaying for it. And you have a latency because you have to string uh, your system together through high-speed networking. So Micron is working on very high-speed memory that's composable through what's called an interface called CXL that is really the industry standard. It was pioneered by, by Intel to be able to have pools of memory. So imagine having a rack full of memory, just like you have a rack full of storage and like you have a rack full of uh, CPU. So uh, we're a couple of years away, but uh, I'm talking with all of the major CSPs out there and all of the major uh, enterprise uh, compute players like the HPEs and the Dells and the Lenovo's and the Cisco's uh, about really this being the next big change uh, inside uh, the data center. So it's not just commodity stuff, folks. It's it's technology that's going to be re-architecting the uh, the data data centers uh, of of the future. So good stuff. So let's uh, move into our next topic, and that's Grok Day. So you're like, wait a second, are you, are you grokking? Are you, what is, uh, what is grok? So let's talk about grok uh, and, and what it is uh, as, as a company. So uh, first off, uh, grok is one of the leaders, if not uh, the leader in, in machine learning right up there with NVIDIA. It's quite smaller than uh, NVIDIA, but there are some use cases and some models, uh, particularly uh, low latency uh, inference like NLP, that they just dominate in the industry. Now, I don't know how they compare to what um, NVIDIA announced uh, last week, but that doesn't matter because Grok is shipping this technology today. Well, uh, you and I um, showed up for their Grok Day event, which I, I thought was was cool on, on a couple fronts. So. First off, it just wasn't about, uh, hey, why I'm great uh, as a company and here's what we're doing. They actually yeah. had um, their competitors there, you know, a competitor called Mythic. Now, Mythic uh, operates at a, uh, a lower power 
than 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 Grok does, and hence lower performance. So, are they really competitors? Yeah, they're competitors, but uh, close enough to where it it doesn't get uh, un, uncomfortable. Uh, and they also had uh, a bunch of cool customers uh, on there as well, which is not is not different uh, or, or 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 not unique. But it was great to see how folk uh, folks like uh, Google Brain, John Hopkins, uh, Mitt House, Differential Sciences came in and and talked about uh, what they're doing. More thought leadership than than pushing Grok, which I appreciated. But I want to focus on one thing, and that and and that was really. Uh, Jonathan Ross, the founder and CEO of the company, how we kicked it off. You know, you and I, we probably do watch two keynotes a day. <laughs> we could probably watch more if if we wanted to. And what is it typically? It's typically a monologue talking about the company. Well, uh, Jonathan actually asked three questions. That 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 was his that was his keynote, uh, and it was, "Hey, is it a winner take all market?" And uh, I appreciated this. He was like, I was wrong. This is not going to be a winner take all market. This is going to be um, uh, many players who are, are going to be here. And the second question, second question he asked was, hey, how do you hire and retain uh, the best talent in you know, this competitive space with folks like Google, uh, Amazon, and, and Meta? And it, his answer was, was, uh, was interesting in that, hey, all we do is machine learning. So essentially, if if you want to come in and be part of something that um, that's all we're doing, right? And, you know, I was thinking like, um, you know, okay, we don't do CPUs, we don't do FPGAs, we don't do GPUs for gaming. Uh, come on in. This is this is all we do. And I think this is, I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting pretty interesting point um and and the third question was uh around is is grok a gpu killer and he was very clear he's like no right we're going to be in a future world that has cpus gpus fpgas and and asics um by the way i like that because that's the story i tell <laughs> i'll uh, i'll be honest with you uh you know but he did say hey there are, there are some some use cases that GPUs just do better, right? So, hey, we're not a GPU killer. We we have to operate. Uh, um, you know, not only do we operate in systems with with GPUs, but there are there are actually use cases that uh, we do um, we do better at. He brought out um, uh, Argon um, supercomputer uh, benchmarks, sh uh, showing that it was uh, fifty percent faster. Than uh, than the A than the A one hundred. So um, that was twenty two hundred A one hundreds versus uh, sixteen uh, Grok chips. So very interesting day. I've just started my my coverage uh, on the company, Daniel. You've been covering them uh, uh, a little bit longer. Yeah, but you did a, you did a really good job. And uh, these Grok days are always great to tune in. It's been a bit of a series for the company. Jonathan's a very interesting, thoughtful. Leader, he actually did a uh, showed up at a six five summit last year, and guess what? They're going to be back this year, so you will have another chance to hear from him at our event. Um, I like that you pointed out the specialty and the focus. I think that's one of the big things here. Is you know when you talk about we've talked about GPUs on this uh, particular pod a few times today. Uh, we talked about it starting with Intel. Well, this is this is about high performance compute. This is about uh, you know accelerated computing. Uh, low latency. You know, the company really does kind of operate on four tenants. It's predictability, low latency, velocity, and scalability. And so they really aren't trying to come into the market and be all things to all people GPU. They're saying, hey, for these specific types of workload where latency is critical, where you want to be able to scale, you know, like you mentioned, what was it, 2200 versus 16? You want to be able to scale uh, at, a, at a reasonable amount of chips <laughs> compute required to do so. Uh, they're working on very specific applications. And, and you know, here's the, the thing is the benchmarks have been incredibly impressive in these specific areas. Um, the company's new. It's entering a, a hyper competitive market with some very, very deeply entrenched players that are sort of the known entities in uh, accelerated compute. And that's going to be a challenge for Grok. Having said that, you know, the company has seen investment from, TP, I believe it's TPG from Tiger, 
uh, major dollars have been poured into this because we all know the uh, magnitude that AI is going to play in our future and the ability for us to take exponential data sets more effectively get that data to insight in a shorter period of time. And that's really what Grok is doing. I believe in uh, his presentation last year at the 6.5 Summit, he said, you know, his, his, his goal is to bring the cost of compute to zero. Um, ambitious, right? I mean, <laughs> with no cost of compute if you're in the business of compute. Yeah. The idea is right between um, architectures, frameworks, software, um, and what developers are capable of, we can make the compute uh, go further for every single uh, ML application that you would build on Grok. So uh, the company's moving in some interesting directions, but I like the leadership. They've recently brought some, you know, you talked about the talent game. They brought some interesting talent on board. I think they brought the CEO of, um, Xilinx, the founder, onto their uh, board of director, but they've had a bunch of academics, uh, big silicon executives uh, with with huge experience come in and want to be part of this story. Uh, and of course, Pat, full disclosure, you and I are both part of this story as investors in the company as well. Uh, and always want to put that out there because yes, we are very bullish and optimistic. We put our money where our mouth is, uh, as I like to say it. Um, uh, but, you know, Pat, as I listen to the company, I continue to be encouraged. The size of market for AI is going to be massive. I don't even think we understand how big this market is going to be. And companies like Grok have an opportunity. Jonathan said it won't be winner take all. Couldn't agree with him more. But they could be a very, very important uh, player in a small set that are going to be winners in this particular space. So, Pat, I will leave it there. Good stuff, man. Yeah, I'm learning new stuff every day, and and I'm you know I'm at the very beginning of of, of my research uh, so far, but uh, I'm glad they're not trying to do everything for everybody because uh, that's just impossible given the diversity in in workloads out there. Let's move to our final topic: IBM Quantum News with HSBC. Daniel, what is going on here? Well, in this case, they want to accelerate quantum computing. So it's all about accelerating stuff, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we are the uh, 6.5 accelerator. We're accelerating we a conversation. Um, yeah, we haven't talked about HP, uh, sorry, IBM Quantum in a while. We haven't talked about quantum that much in a while. It's gotten a little quiet after a period of time where there was a lot of announcements. We saw companies like INQ go public. We saw a Honeywell spin off with uh, CQC to create Continuum. Um, but, you know, what's happening with quantum? Well, it seems to me that what we're doing now is we've kind of entered an era of bringing quantum to life through real world applications and partnerships. So IBM uh, yesterday or two days ago made an announcement alongside HSBC, uh, one of the world's largest financial institutions, that they're going to do a multi-year collaboration to basically uh, help HSBC bolster its uh, quantum experience. Um, and essentially what I think is going on, Pat, is IBM is working closely side by side with the company to help them really understand what quantum is capable of and figure out how to implement it as part of their business. So for a company like IBM, this is going to mean giving access to systems, um, including we talked about the Eagle on this show, right? It's Eagle right. processor um, and also, you know, working closely with the company to do some validation of potential use cases. Now, in this particular space, financial services, one of them is like anti-money laundering and fraud. This is like a huge opportunity right now when you have um, the volume of, of, of transactions that are going on, um, you know, you need additional technology. This is where AI and accelerated workloads are coming into place. This is also where quantum is coming into to, to place. Uh, really important to note though, quantum is not a replacement in any way of what they're doing with IBM. It's not serving in any way as a replacement to classical computing and what you do with uh, accelerated computing to solve these problems. What's really going on is um, it's transformative. It's working in uh, partnership with or in concert with to say, hey, let's take the best of what classical computing can do and let's take the best of what quantum computing can do to potentially increase accuracy and more quickly get the insights that are required. Um, Pat, as I see it, I believe financial institutions are a massive opportunity for quantum computing. Uh, we've seen studies in the past from the likes of JP Morgan. Now you're seeing HSBC. Um, we have a decade of fairly significant innovation that's going to go on in quantum. It's going to be done in partnership. We're going to see more simulation where you're going to see quantum workloads being deployed in public clouds or in cloud type of, of architectures. 
uh, so that you can take advantage of them uh, in concert, like I said, with your classical computing applications. And for IBM as a whole, I think the, the continuous drip of notifying the market, hey, we're winning customers, we're winning large academic institutions, we're winning think tanks, uh, research labs around the world, to be able to say, hey, this technology is valid. And of course, IBM built on superconducting, you've got the likes of of C, uh, sorry, of Quantinuum and IonQ that are built on ion trapping. There's still architectural debates going on in the marketplace, but the opportunities in markets and finance and energy, basically everywhere you see AI and predictions at scale being done to try to help industries take masses of data, there are parallel applications that Quantum can support and bring more value to market as well. This is one example that IBM has. So HSBC, this is cool, but I think overall what's really cool is what this means in terms of building meaningful, understandable applications for the market. Dan, good job here, buddy. Uh, I want to add a couple things. So first of all, if, you know, quantum is, you know, one of the next big leaps in computing, and we all have to ask ourselves, hey, is this, what phase are we in now, right? You know, there were four phases of AI before it became real. Heck, it took us 25 years uh, to popularize the touchscreen uh, when it came out for uh, a computer. But <clears throat> I can safely say, based on my research, that quantum will be real and quantum will add incremental value over um, traditional computing. And the only question uh, is when. I think over the next three years, we are going to see SaaS services and we are going to see um, solutions that are going to be better and demonstrate quantum supremacy for algorithms that people actually care about. <laughs> and and I, say, I say that is because Google already uh, showed quantum supremacy, but it was, you know, it was on an algorithm that nobody's really doing anything with. So uh, we have to look at it like that. Uh, I also want to talk about IBM strategy, which is to be essentially a full stack provider, right? They have the hardware, they have uh, the developer tools, they have uh, the ecosystem. They pretty much have everything uh, in place. I mean, they have multiple ways to consume uh, uh, as well. I think the, the only thing that IBM uh, needs to always be looking at is uh, our superconductors going to be the technology that are going to take us into the next generation related to not only the number of qubits, uh, the quality of qubits, but also the size of the installations that are required uh, 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 to do this. Um, but right now, that's the only thing that IBM uh, has to be looking at. It's it's very one of the reasons that I think, in addition to to you know some of the benefits of IBM's strategy for quantum that it brings to the table is is trust. Uh, if you look at IBM's roadmap that it put out, I think like six years ago, and what they committed to, they're actually delivering uh, to promises that they made uh, that long ago. And and if I do a sweep and I, I look at what I've been told by some of the quantum computers makers, they're slipping schedules all over the place. And if they give a roadmap, it might be, I don't know, two years long or it's 10 years long where, where nobody's going to remember that. So I think so far, uh, IBM Quantum has engendered trust uh, across its customers because it's actually delivering what it says it's going to deliver. So with that, Daniel, um, that is the end of IBM Quantum and the end of this podcast. We talked about Intel, Oracle, Micron, Grok, and of course, IBM. I know you can read that. That's good. But my bestie, it's great to be here with you. It on is. Friday. It is. And as you know, everybody knows out there, the way this works is we want you to hit that subscribe button. Join us on what Spotify, Apple, YouTube, cross social media. Um, any discrepancies or challenges to the commentary being made on this show should be directly sent towards my friend here at Patrick Moorhead. 
his Twitter is red hot. You can read it. It's got way more fun going on than mine does. But if you've got the, you know, if you're going to pass a few compliments because you really enjoyed our, our commentary or analysis, uh, Daniel Newman UV, that's where you can find me. I need that kind of support uh, Monday. Send it on Monday because today I'm feeling good. Ultraviolet Dan, UV Dan, baby. I love that. I wish I had something cool like that. But anyways, folks, if you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button. Uh, have a great weekend. Not as fluid as we normally are, Daniel, but, you know, what can we say? We appreciate you and take care.